Namaste and welcome. I'm Suhag Shukla, the Hindu American Foundation's Executive Director. And tonight we're excited to host HAF's fourth Coping with COVID webinar series. Tonight's topic, Building Immunity with Ayurveda and Integrative Medicine. Ayurveda, India's ancient system of healing, defines good health not by the absence of disease, but the presence of physical, mental, and spiritual wellness. Integrative medicine, a modern holistic medical discipline, views health through the patient's physical, emotional, mental, social, spiritual, and environmental influences. Are these systems complementary? What role do they play in cultivating good health? How can ancient practices be combined with modern medicine to help build immunity? Tonight, we're pleased to have Dr. Akhil Balani Swami, Sami, a Harvard-trained physician who practices integrative medicine at the Institute for Health and Healing in San Francisco, who will answer these questions and more. Before I introduce him more formally, some housekeeping items. We'll be recording tonight's program, and it will be released on the Hindu American Foundation's podcast, That's So Hindu. Uh, participant phones have been muted given the number of registrants, but uh, we will have a Q&A, so please use the Q&A feature to uh, ask any of your questions. We will do our best to answer as many as we can, but Dr. Balani Sami has a very comprehensive presentation for us, uh, and so he will speak and present for 40 minutes, and that will be followed by uh, 20 minutes of Q&A, <clears throat> approximately. He does have a slide deck. Um, if you are calling in, don't worry. We will make that slide deck available um, in the follow-up email that you will receive. So please use the Q&A for your questions, but do pay attention. Your questions might be answered in his comprehensive presentation. Dr. Palani Sami's uh, approach blends the best of conventional medicine and complementary medicine, such as Ayurveda. He's worked with thousands of patients over the years to help them heal and recover. He's author of The Paleo-Vedic Diet, uh, a book offering a comprehensive roadmap to optimal health, combining the most effective aspects of the paleo diet with Ayurveda and the latest scientific research. With no further ado, welcome Dr. Palani Sami. Thank you, Suhag. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm very happy to be sharing this um, knowledge with everyone. So namaste, everyone. And I'm excited to be talking today about um, Ayurveda. So I think that Ayurveda has a tremendous amount to offer in terms of the ancient wisdom that I like to blend with modern science and modern um, scientific research as well. So my approach to Ayurveda is really very scientific because originally I studied biochemistry in college. And then when I was doing my medical training, that's when I began uh, incorporating Ayurveda as well. So I have a lot of information that I'd like to cover tonight. Um, so I'm going to go fairly quickly, but you'll be getting copies of the slides and we'll have plenty of, times, uh, plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So Ayurveda in Sanskrit is literally the science of life. It's the oldest system of medicine. And this quotation from um, Ayurveda indicates the primacy of diet because food is medicine and it's really fundamental in terms of keeping us all healthy today. The quotation is, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. When diet is right, medicine is of no need. So Ayurveda comes from the Pancha Mahabhuta philosophy of India, which is the five elements, which are space, air, fire, water, and earth. And in the body, these five elements come together to form the three doshas, which are forces. And when these three forces are in balance, that's what ultimately leads to health. They are vata, pitta, and kapha. And Ayurveda emphasizes the body's self-healing ability. I think that's something very important today. We need to trust in that and remind ourselves of that. And it's much more than a system of medicine. It's really a way of life and a very um, <clears throat> comprehensive approach as well. So it offers a um, personalized and individualized program and emphasizes detoxification and rejuvenation as well. So in terms of the three doshas, there is this concept of the prakriti, which is the body type. So this is determined at conception, depending on the proportion of vata, pitta, and kapha. And every person is unique. So for example, let's say a person is born with 50% vata, 30% kapha, and 
uh, 20% pitta. So the goal is not to return to, to all three uh, being equal, like one third of all three. The goal is to return to that original state. So the vikriti is the current state of the doshas, which are typically out of balance. But in that example, the goal would be to return to the state of prakriti with the 50% vata, 30% kapha, and 20% pitta. So where life is always a process of seeking balance, and Ayurveda can help us to achieve that. So I like to integrate modern science, and there has been some research that has proven this concept of prakriti. So actually, this research paper published a couple of years ago found that there are distinct genetic differences between the prakritis or body types that explains these differences. And this is despite linguistic, ethnic, and geographical diversity in this research study. They found that there were these consistent three body types that appeared uh, across different populations, and there's a genetic basis for that as well. So along with the three doshas, we have the three subtle essences. So in addition to vata, pitta, and kapha, we have prana, tejas, and ojas. So going along with vata is prana, which is the subtle element responsible for circulation, digestion, movement, and excretion. Prana, you can also think of as life force. Going with is tejas, which regulates metabolism, cellular intelligence, and digestion. And for us today, the topic of immunity, ojas is the most relevant. This is the counterpart of kapha, and it's the refined end product of digestion. So in Ayurveda, there's the concept of seven dhatus or tissues. And actually, ojas is made from all seven, just indicating how important immunity is. It's also correlated with longevity, vigor, and vitality. So all of the foods which I'm going to be talking about today are foods that build ojas because in Ayurveda, one of the predispositions to disease is a low ojas. And with a detailed Ayurvedic analysis, you know, we'd be able to come up with uh, individualized diet for each person, uh, customized according to the prakriti. We don't have time for that today, but I'm going to focus on foods that build ojas and support immunity. So other factors that predispose to illness are uh, poor diet, poor lifestyle, excessive sugar, uh, excessive alcohol consumption. Of course, stress is a, a very big factor as well. And uh, Ayurveda recognizes the role of toxins in the environment, which we're all exposed to. <clears throat> and that's why it emphasizes detoxification practices. So in Ayurveda, there are six stages of disease and symptoms usually appear in stage five. So the goal of Ayurveda is to catch disease before it manifests, is to focus on prevention. So stage one typically begins with the weakening in Agni, which is the digestive fire. And that weakened Agni leads to production of Ama, or metabolic toxins, and that is the first of those six stages. So that's why it's so important to maintain gut health, because um, disease begins in the gut, and we'll talk about today how to keep the Agni strong and prevent this development of ama or toxins. So uh, why does Ayurveda matter so much today with COVID-19? Well, we know that with the disease, there is a wide spectrum of severity. So we know with COVID-19, about 81% of cases are mild to moderate. And so four-fifths of people recover you know, without needing to be in the hospital. And that's not very newsworthy, but those, that is what the data shows. So this paper published in a journal in March of 2020 uh, studied a, a person who responded well in a, in a mild case. So this was someone who recovered within days of exposure to COVID-19. And the authors write that days following symptom onset, a large number of specialized helper T cells, killer T cells, and B cells, all of which are crucial immune cells, were active in the patient's blood samples. So basically, there was a very robust immune response, and that was what led to this person recovering quickly uh, from COVID-19. And the same thing has been shown in other infections as well, like flu. So we know that immunity matters, and that's why for prevention, Ayurveda, I think, has so much to offer. Second reason is that with this disease, we know that um, inflammation is really a critical factor. <clears throat> so here is pictured the um, 
NLRP3 inflammasome. So it's a little bit technical, but basically what you need to know is that this is a compound within the cell that is triggered by the virus. So when COVID-19 attacks, for example, the, the lungs and causes pneumonia, uh, which can lead to ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, it causes the damage mostly by activating this inflammasome, by triggering excessive hyperinflammation. Uh, and so the more we can keep inflammation down and under control, the more that we can um, prevent the manifestation of severe disease. And that's where Ayurveda really excels because of its ability to reduce inflammation and uh, keep the immunity strong. So the summary of what we're gonna be talking about today includes uh, of course, diet and vitamins. We're also going to talk about spices, herbs, and supplements. And then we'll talk about um, other parts of daily routine, uh, such as dinacharya, known as, um, which is basically uh, the importance of a daily routine. So that includes things like exercise, um, sauna therapy, nasya, oil pulling, and importance of sleep and rest, as well as other uh, practices. So Ayurveda really teaches us how to live the way we evolved to live with the diet as the foundation, uh, importance to balance that with exercise daily, having adequate sleep, managing stress, and dinacharya, which is that daily routine that's so crucial to stay healthy. But I'd like to take a bigger um, evolutionary perspective as well. So let's look at the big picture in terms of human evolution. I think we can learn a lot from taking that perspective. So we know that for millions of years, we evolved as hunter-gatherers, and that's how our bodies evolved to thrive on that sort of diet, because only about 10,000 years ago, agriculture began. So what did our ancestors in the Paleolithic era eat? You know, that's called the paleo diet. So we know from um, anthropology and research that they ate primarily wild plant foods, such as leaves, tubers, roots, fruits, nuts, beans, and legumes. And they hunted meat and fish if it was available. But an interesting fact was they also uh, consumed many different types of plants. So about 100 to 100, 120 different plants per year and every single day they would eat um, 20 different species of vegetables and fruits. So in modern uh, America, we've, uh, the studies show that on average, the, a person eats eight different kinds of fruits and vegetables per year. So I think that that's one tip that we can uh, follow if we want to improve the diversity of our diet and get more gut uh, bacteria, which are um, in various colors. And on the right lower part of the image is in blue is the uh, human cells. And in green in the middle is the mucus layer and that uh, protects our cells from the bacteria. So the diversity of plant foods is what really leads to a diversity of bacteria. So um, keeping this microbiome healthy is essential for health. And that is very much consistent with the Ayurvedic approach of keeping the Agni strong. <clears throat> so these are the um, top 10 immune boosting foods, which we're going to be <clears throat> going over. Let me grab a bit of water. <clears throat> okay, so, so first we're going to talk about leafy greens. And we know that leafy greens like spinach or kale are very healthy, but uh, new research has shown that they have unique compounds called SQ sugars, which are prebiotic. And that means that they feed these beneficial bacteria. So having a variety of leafy greens really is important for that microbiome. Now, a common question is raw versus cooked. So in general, in Ayurveda, it's recommended to have uh, cooked food mostly, and you don't lose the nutrients with uh, leafy greens. It also depends on the per person's uh, dosha. So someone with more uh, pitta uh, can actually have more raw fruits and vegetables, whereas someone with more of a vata body type would be recommended to have uh, more cooked. So in general, you want to have a, a mixture of both raw and cooked foods, but with 
greens and vegetables, it's definitely fine to have cooked vegetables. So here are some other options in terms of the leafy green vegetables. So we know that um, these compounds known as flavonoids in plants actually reduce the inflammasome, the NLRP3 signaling. So for inflammation, these are actually very powerful um, superfoods. So good, good alternatives here, um, instead of getting iceberg lettuce, which is really very low in nutrients, you can choose um, arugula, you can choose a radicchio, which has this um, beautiful purplish color, which reflects anthocyanins. You can choose loose leaf lettuce, which also is very nutritious. So getting all these um, diversity of leafy green vegetables is really very important. So second food is actually mushrooms. Now mushrooms have these unique compounds called beta-glucans, which actually activate our immune system. So they are um, very beneficial for the gut bacteria. They increase um, rosaberia, bifidobacteria, lactobacillus. So all of these important keystone species of the gut microbiome. And you may not know, but mushrooms are also uh, very potent anti-inflammatory. So getting a variety of uh, mushrooms is really a good idea, like uh, Asian mus mushrooms like shiitake, maitake, those kinds of things, oyster mushrooms, um, button mushrooms, portobello. So just getting as much of a variety as you can will really go a long way towards keeping your um, gut healthy. So um, cold water fish like salmon or sardines is also beneficial. The omega-3 content is really crucial because for the immune system, we really need optimal levels of omega-3. Other nutrients uh, that are crucial are selenium, vitamin A, and vitamin D. Now having adequate vitamin D also has been shown to lower the um, inflammasome activity. And um, there's not many foods that contain vitamin D, but fish is one of them. And if you are a vegetarian for um, omega-3s, you can have flax seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts. But I think um, cold water fish offers a unique blend of foods, a uh, blend, blend of nutrients that are really key for immune health. So next we'll talk about bone broth. So I think of this as uh, chicken soup. So if you're making chicken soup, you can keep the bones um, in there. And studies have actually shown that uh, chicken soup does have an antiviral effect, which, they, which is why they say chicken soup is good for colds. And also it is, um, does have an anti-inflammatory effect. So I think that um, incorporating bone broth, um, which also has gelatin and glycine, uh, which help with healing the gut and keeping the microbiome healthy is really a good regular practice to, um, to keep the agni strong as well. So pumpkin seeds are one of the natural sources of zinc. Uh, in fact, the, the food that's the richest source of zinc. So we know that zinc reduces viral replication and it's been studied in other coronaviruses besides COVID-19 and may prevent the entry into cells. So we know that zinc lozenges are commonly sold for um, colds and sore throats and they do have a benefit there. But the best way, you know, I believe is really getting your nutrients through food. So that's why I'm talking about all these foods today that are very high in those key vitamins and minerals. And pumpkin seeds are really the best way to get um, adequate levels of zinc. So we also know that vitamin C is really good for the immune system. It inhibits the NLRP3 uh, inflammasome and vitamin C shortens frequency and severity of colds and incidence of pneumonia. So having uh, one orange a day is a good way to get your daily intake of vitamin C. I think that uh, um, you know, oranges are uh, also rich in other phytonutrients and fiber and um, simple in order to provide us that daily intake of vitamin C that is so crucial for our immune function. So this food is lesser known, but ties into the Ayurvedic concept of detoxification. So these are beet greens, which is the leafy top of the beetroot. And the beet greens actually have this unique compound called TMG, which supports the liver, supports uh, detoxification in phase two. And beet greens also have um, anti-inflammatory nutrients like beta-lanes and betanin that are not found in any other foods. So they're unique in terms of the nutrients that they have. 
So I think if you're having beets, you can um, try to get them with the greens on top and you can cook them just like you would spinach or kale, uh, any other leafy green. And then you can have the beetroot as well, which has um, a lot of antioxidants and other nutrients. So we know the saying about an apple a day, keeping the doctor away. So apples, their skin actually contains this compound called quercetin. Now quercetin helps downregulate uh, NLRP3 and modulates the immune system. So having an, uh, an apple with the skin every day ensures that our body has adequate levels of that nutrient. So there was a study which looked at this inflammasome in immune cells called macrophages and found that the quercetin helps to block the activation of the inflammation in those immune cells. Next, we're going to talk about fermented foods. So this is a controversial topic, but I think that there's a lot of benefit because the, they have probiotics, which are these good bacteria that help uh, with supporting your own microbiome. So that might include foods like yogurt, kefir, um, and um, sauerkraut, or kimchi, which is a pickled cabbage. Also kombucha, which is a fermented um, beverage. And if you have a dairy sensitivity, you can have the sauerkraut or the kimchi, or you can also have non-dairy yogurts. Now there are coconut-based yogurt, almond-based yogurt. So the, um, studies show that fermented foods actually reduce inflammation in healthy people. And you don't need to have a large quantity. So like one tablespoon um, you know, per, per day of sauerkraut or yogurt helps to provide that live uh, culture. And the important thing is the consistency, having um, regular dosage, not necessarily the quantity. So apple cider vinegar is one of the um, best foods to keep your agni strong. So in Ayurveda, it's recommended every morning to have a tall glass of hot water. And you can mix in a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and a tablespoon of honey. And that's a good way to start your day. Um, apple cider vinegar is made from apples, but it has an effect of really supporting metabolism and um, strengthening the digestive fire. And uh, <clears throat> it's very concentrated, so you should never have it straight. You always want to dilute it. So um, start with one teaspoon and work up to about one tablespoon in um, you know tall uh, glass of water. And um, that would be a very beneficial way to start the day, to keep the agni strong, keep the metabolism strong, and also uh, keep that digestion healthy. Because uh, as we discussed, you know, 60% of the immune system is in the gut. So the focus in Ayurveda for immunity is really uh, keeping the gut healthy. <clears throat> Another way that you can keep the agni strong is with spices. So in Ayurveda, spices are also considered medicine. And I like to talk ab about them as the kitchen pharmacy that we all have access to. So spices are very nutrient dense. They're rich in antioxidants. They reduce inflammation, of course, support the digestion, and also help with metabolism and blood sugar, which is one of the fundamental aspects of health. So ginger is traditionally used in Ayurveda to fight infections and has been shown to be helpful for preventing colds and flus. Uh, fresh ginger is actually active against RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, which is a common cause of lung infections in children. And research on the antibacterial activity of ginger also found that it inhibited the growth of multi-drug resistant bacteria. So just indicating how powerful it really is. And I'll have a recipe a little bit later on that incorporates ginger, but it's definitely the real deal in terms of helping keep the immune system strong and prevent viruses. So garlic, now it contains over 100 distinct phytochemicals and allicin, which is one of the main one, um, it suppresses inflammatory cytokines, which are these um, signaling molecules your immune system uses like IL-6. And um, so this anti-inflammatory effect is very potent for um, keeping the immune system healthy. <clears throat> now it's very important to prepare garlic the right way. 
And that's because when you um, crush or mince uh, garlic, it takes about 10 minutes for enzymes to synthesize and produce that allicin. So if you just crush garlic and use it right away, you're actually not getting those health benefits. You are getting the flavor, but you're not really getting the medicinal properties. So the best way is to crush or chop garlic and then allow 10 minutes for those um, uh, enzymes to work. And then the allicin is heat stable. So you can cook it or fry the garlic and still get the, uh, all the health benefits. So that's the best way to, to use garlic. <clears throat> So we all know about the benefits of turmeric, which is um, really tremendous. So pertinent to our discussion today, turmeric does have antiviral effects and reduces these um, immune system signal, signals called cytokines and does inhibit that NLRP3 inflammasome. So to maximize the benefits of turmeric and uh, increase its absorption, there was a study that showed combining it with black pepper actually increase the absorption by 2,000%. So that's why in most recipes, turmeric is combined with black pepper. Also having some ghee or another healthy fat is very beneficial for boosting the absorption. So I think uh, it's, uh, it's true that turmeric is very um, maybe hyped right now, but I think that studies do show that a lot of those um, benefits are really uh, proven and justified. So cinnamon <clears throat> is more well known for its effect on blood sugar, but in Ayurveda, it's also used a lot for its antimicrobial effects, you know, antiviral, antibacterial, and cinnamon inhibits the growth of this pathogenic fungus known as candida. And there was a study which found that the essential oil of cinnamon inhibited five out of six harmful bacteria as well. So I think that um, getting cinnamon in different forms, like incorporating it into your chai, you know, incorporating it in, um, for example, oatmeal. You can have a teaspoon um, or half a teaspoon of cinnamon with a powder in your oatmeal every day. Um, incorporating in herbal teas is good as well. And I'll talk about a recipe later that incorporates um, cinnamon. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about a few um, Ayurvedic herbs and supplements. And just to clarify, there are no human research trials with COVID-19 and any natural herbs or um, treatments that are proven to work. And this um, information is not a recommendation to take any herbs or supplements, which you, you should only take under the supervision of a practitioner. And also none of the things we're talking about today are a substitute for proven conventional measures like hand washing, social distancing. All of these things are complementary to those proven measures. So first we'll talk about amla, also known as amalaki. So this is the Indian gooseberry, which you might have seen in your local Indian store. Very nutrient dense, a very rich source of vitamin C and other phytochemicals. And there was a study which found that the um, amla extract actually significantly improved antioxidant status, um, endothelial function, which is how the blood vessels work, and also was uh, very good at reducing inflammation and helped um, in this study with uh, lipid profile like cholesterol and blood sugar. <clears throat> so I think that there are different forms. Um, you can incorporate the Indian, the, the amla fresh. Um, often it's available as a pickle. And um, one of the most common forms of taking amla is actually chawan prash. So chawan prash is a um, medicinal jam, which is made from about 50 herbs and extracts. Amla is actually the main ingredient. So Chawan Prash is a formula from the Ch uh, Charaka Samhita, which is a book that was um, written about 2,400 years ago. And it's a tridoshic formula. So again, it supports Vata, Pitta, and Kapha. And it's an ojas building formula. So just like all the foods we've been talking about, um, certain herbs are very good for building ojas and um, supplements like chavan prash just help uh, boost that to another level. So chavan prash is prepared by making an herbal decoction of certain uh, medicinal herbs and then mixing with ghee and honey and then adding certain spices like cardamom and fennel and cinnamon. So studies show that chavan prash is actually very rich in vitamin C, 
polyphenols and flavonoids and has a very high antioxidant activity and does enhance immune response. So there was a study which was a six month um, randomized clinical trial actually in children aged five to 12 years old, which showed that the taking Chavan Prash daily, uh, one teaspoon, helps to improve immunity and uh, energy levels. And I often get asked, you know, what can I give my children to, to help during this time? And I believe Chavan Prash is pretty safe. So it's been studied in children ages five and older. Um, and um, taste is not, you know, not, not bad. It's uh, actually kind of sweet. So just uh, providing one teaspoon a day, I think, is a good way to uh, provide these antioxidants and nutrients, vitamin C, and also um, keep the immune system healthy. So cod liver oil is another food that I've listed here because um, it's a very rich source of vitamin A and also vitamin D, which as we talked about, activates our innate immune cells. So um, my uh, wife who grew up in India remembers that every night um, with um, her father would give her and her siblings a teaspoon of cod liver oil. And um, you know, growing up, I had that experience as well. It, it tasted terrible, but I think that it's actually a very healthy food. And I think it's a very beneficial practice um, because these are nutrients that um, children need for many reasons, um, you know, as part of their growth. Vitamin D is very important for bone health. But this is another thing which is safe for, for children. Um, just one teaspoon a day provides those essential nutrients and helps with keeping immune health strong. So next we're going to talk about elderberry. So on the left is pictured wild elderberry and on the right is a batch of uh, elderberry beverage which we made last week which we like to do during um, cold and flu season and we'll talk, I will talk about the recipe for that. <clears throat> so lab studies do show that elderberry inhibits the replication of another coronavirus called the um, human coronavirus NL63. Um, it seems to be most effective with viral infections in the early stages, so prevention is uh, helpful and uh, catching it early. And the Natural Standard Research Collaboration found evidence to support the use of elderberry to prevent uh, influenza, the common flu. So this is a simple way to prepare um, elderberry. So you can either grow it yourself or um, you know, we buy them online. You can buy dried elderberries. Um, the form of it doesn't matter so much. <clears throat> but basically, you take 16 ounces of water, and then you add uh, eight ounces of elderberries, a quarter teaspoon of cinnamon powder, and ginger. So either one teaspoon of ground ginger, or uh, you can take two inches of fresh ginger and just chop it finely. Add 12 cloves and two tablespoons of honey. So you simmer that for about 20 minutes uh, on medium heat, and then you allow it to cool. And then at that point, you um, add the honey. So in Ayurveda, you should never heat honey because that um, makes, it more, makes it toxic. So you allow the infusion to cool, and then you can add the, uh, the honey. So honey actually has been shown in a couple of studies to be very helpful for cough as well. It's very um, soothing for the throat. It's considered medicinal in Ayurveda. So there were two studies which found that uh, honey actually was better than dextromethorphan, which is a common over-the-counter cough suppressant in easing nighttime cough in children and improving their sleep. So that's why honey is part of the recipe. And uh, on its own, it's also um, very good for the immune system. So I'd like to talk about ashwagandha. So this is one of the powerful herbs in Ayurveda. It's known as an adaptogen. So that means that it helps the body to adapt to stress. It's also known as a rasayana or rejuvenator and a very powerful um, ojas building formula. So typically the root if of ashwagandha is used and it's often powdered. So ashwagandha in studies has been shown to help the body lower cortisol levels, these are levels of stress hormones, reduce anxiety, reduce stress, and also improve inflammation. And um, ashwagandha is a very heating herb, so it's traditionally taken with milk to ba balance that heating property, but it can be taken as an herbal tea or in other forms as well. 
So there was one study that found consuming ashwagandha led to an increase in levels of white blood cells and those natural killer cells that are important for immune health, and also found the uh, increase in the number of CD4 positive helper T cells. So it's very important to uh, use caution if you have hyperthyroidism because ashwagandha um, supports the thyroid and stimulates the thyroid. So if you have a low thyroid or underactive thyroid, that might be beneficial. But if you have hyperthyroidism with too much thyroid hormone, then ashwagandha would be contraindicated. So it just illustrates the power of um, herbal medicine. Just wanted to give this one example here to show that um, <clears throat> you know there are really potent uh, herbs in Ayurveda to support immune health. I think, of course, food is the foundation, but um, ashwagandha in herbal tea form is something that uh, can be taken as well. So now we're going to discuss some other aspects of health, so the non-material aspects. We've talked about food and spices and herbs. So one interesting effect is the role of sunlight. So in Ayurveda, sunbathing is uh, strongly encouraged. And this study from Georgetown University Medical Center found a surprising benefit from sunlight in that it energizes the infection-fighting uh, immune cells known as T cells. So the author of this study, uh, Dr. Jared Ahern, said that we all know sunlight provides vitamin D, which is suggested to have an impact on immunity and other things. But what we found is a completely separate role of sunlight on immunity. So a uh, picture here is my daughter enjoying the sunshine and getting, um, getting out there to build up her vitamin D and build up her T cells. So in terms of the benefits of um, sunlight, vitamin D is crucial for bone health, cancer prevention, and brain health, and also very important for immune function. <clears throat> so as we um, discussed, it does stimulate T cell movement. Um, so it helps your T cells get to the site of infection. So for example, if there's an infection in your throat or in your lungs, it's very important for the immune cells to get there quickly and regular sunlight exposure uh, helps them to do that. Sunlight also regulates our circadian rhythm, which affects sleep patterns and hormones. And exposure to sunlight during the daytime, even if it's only through a window or by getting out on a patio, can actually help sleep quality at night. So there's a lot of benefits to uh, daily sunlight exposure. And um, I typically recommend aiming for about 30 minutes, at least three times a week. So if you're not able to do it every day, getting it at least uh, three times a week for 30 minutes would be a good dosage for sunlight. So connecting to nature is also very important. There have been studies that showed an increased number of natural killer cells in people who spent time in a forest versus those who stayed in an urban environment. Now they've also shown that 20 minutes in um, urban nature locale like a backyard or a patio can lower cortisol, that stress hormone. And if you um, don't uh, have access to a backyard, uh, actually house plants or even just pictures of nature scenes have a calming effect. So if all you can do is you know, incorporate some pictures in your house or look at pictures of a forest environment on your computer, I think that is still beneficial. But trying to create a healing environment at home is really important because we're spending so much more time at home now. So having the um, beneficial you know, pictures, having house plants, uh, having incense or um, you know, aromatherapy, having soothing music playing. I think all of those things are very beneficial. And my daughter, who's an animal lover, loves to um, play with our pets in our backyard, or um, she also really enjoys horseback riding as well. <clears throat> so stress is a really huge topic. And we have a very short amount of time today to talk. So I just wanna relate this to the immune system because it's been shown that stress disrupts uh, immune regulation and leads to high levels of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which are the more um, negative ones in our immune system. And in um, studies, and uh, stress has been shown to increase that NLRP3 inflammasome that we talked about that's pertinent to COVID-19. 
And chronic stress is linked to increased severity and frequency of viral infections. And this is why I'm a big believer in a daily mind-body practice. Those are really crucial, like um, yoga, pranayama, meditation. And that's why I really emphasize that and teach that in my work as well. So talking now about dinacharya or that daily practice, the daily routine that's so crucial. So exercise is essential. Um, if you're only able to do walking, that is still beneficial. Aim for about 20 minutes every day. Um, yoga practice, again, has many benefits beyond physical, but it does provide some good exercise. And for those who are more ambitious, there is an approach called um, HIIT, or High Intensity Interval Training, which seeks to replicate the way our ancestors moved. And it's an exercise that only takes uh, 10 minutes or so, but gives you um, lasting benefits for, you know, the, for the rest of the week. You only need to do it uh, once or twice a week. So I don't have time to go into that today, but I do cover that in my book and, and courses because I think moving the way our ancestors did is a very powerful practice. So sauna therapy is actually a big part of uh, Ayurveda. So it's part of um, Panchakarma, which is the most powerful detox practice in Ayurveda, and also the Purva Karmas, which, has, which are the preparation for Panchakarma. The reason is that in sauna, you, you detoxify through your skin by sweating. And that's different from what happens in exercise. It's not the same. So you don't really detoxify um, when your body is heated internally, like you would uh, find in exercise. But if the body is heated externally, like through sauna or steam, that leads to um, very high detoxification. Now, sauna bathing has been shown to reduce the risk of respiratory diseases, reduce the risk of lung disease. Regular sauna practice also reduces the frequency and severity of colds and flus in um, both adults and children. So there is good evidence that it helps the immune system, helps the heart as well, um, helps with detoxification. Now, none of us are able to go out and go to the gym, so what are alternatives um, for the, the home? So pictured here is a, a portable home sauna, so you can actually buy these um, for a couple hundred dollars online, and you just um, set it up at home. In Ayurveda, they recommend never to heat the head, and so this is uh, consistent with that. The head is outside, so there's a chair where you just sit inside and zip yourself up and then turn on the sauna. About 20 minutes, twice or three times a week is a good practice. And I think that uh, if you don't have access to that, if you have a bathtub, um, taking a hot bath with water as hot as you can tolerate is also a, a good alternative. Okay, so in terms of other practices that support respiratory health, so the neti pot is um, very beneficial as well. This is a small plastic or ceramic vessel where you put in um, purified water, so either distilled water or boiled and cooled water. Take eight ounces of water and add one teaspoon of sea salt. And if you like, you can also add um, some uh, two drops of sesame oil. We'll talk next about nasya, but having some oil in the neti pot is an option as well. And this is basically how you practice. If you're putting the neti pot in the right nostril, then you lean your head to the left and forward, and then the water flows through the sinuses, kind of cleanses, and then um, comes out the left nostril. And then you would repeat the same in the opposite uh, direction. And the neti pot is really powerful for cleansing the sinuses, lubricating, and uh, keeping their cilia, which is the small hairs that uh, keep the immune system strong there, functioning optimally. And it's best if you can either incorporate the sesame oil um, into the neti pot or do nasya after the neti pot, because this is a lubrication practice. So nasya is a nasal application of oil. And this is part of panchakarma, actually one of those five panchakarma therapies. And it's recommended in Ayurveda for um, allergies, sinusitis, dizziness, brain fog, anxiety, and depression. So the nose uh, is actually a pathway to the brain. And so Ayurveda uses that for brain conditions as well. So how to perform it? So if you're not doing it right after the neti pot, you can do it um, also at bedtime. The key thing is it should be on an empty stomach 
and also not right after um, a shower or exercise. So you lie down with the head tilted back and put about four to five drops of nasya in each nostril. Inhale deeply, remain lying for a minute or so, and then you can, um, you can go on to you know, the next practice. So oil pulling is also a very powerful Ayurvedic uh, practice. This is done on an empty stomach with either um, sesame or coconut oil. And you basically take a teaspoon of the oil into the mouth and swish and pull the oil around through the teeth for about five to 10 minutes. And the oil is believed to drop toxins and also waste metabolites. And at that point, you can um, dispose of the oil in the trash, so obviously, don't um, swallow the oil and also if it's better not to spit it into the sink because that can affect the plumbing. And oil pulling is very beneficial for the agni or digestive fire. And it's also um, very beneficial for the oral microbiome, which we're learning a lot about. So I'm gonna talk next about the importance of rest and sleep. So sleep duration has been known to increase the risk of infection. And there was one study that found that getting less than five hours of sleep over just one week actually increased the risk of developing a cold by 350% when compared to individuals who slept at least seven hours per night. So each person is different in terms of um, how much sleep you get. General rule is um, usually minimum of seven hours, sometimes longer. But you should be, when you wake up in the morning, you should feel rested. And that's a good um, barometer for how much sleep you need. And uh, pertinent to COVID-19, sleep deprivation has been known to increase CXCL9, which is a compound that um, uh, has been known to affect that NLRP3 inflammasome as well. So all of these factors relate to our immune health. So a um, couple of other things that are pertinent to immune function. So when I was doing my research, I came across the importance of a positive attitude. And this has a surprisingly large effect on health. In fact, there are 83 research studies which show that optimists enjoy better health in areas like longevity, cancer survival, physical symptoms, and even with immune function. So there are different studies which have found that a positive attitude improves T cell counts, natural killer cell levels, interleukins, which are these signaling molecules in our immune system, and other markers of immune function. So I think it's, it's true that actually having a positive attitude helps with supporting immune health and improving various parameters of the immune system. And this was a quotation that I think captured it perfectly. This is the uh, Bengali spiritual teacher, Paramahansa Yogananda, who lived in the 1900s. And this was um, what he wrote. He, he said, avoid a negative approach to life. Why gaze down the sewers when there is loveliness all around us? Life has a bright side and a dark side. Look only for the good in everything. Now, I know that right now we're going through a health crisis and it's very hard to be positive because we're, there, we're all under so much stress. So I, I don't want to minimize that. I think it's, it's true that we're all dealing with a tremendous amount of stress. And I'm not saying to suppress one's emotions, you know, whatever you're feeling, that's important to honor and respect that. But I think it's, it's also possible once you honor your emotions to look at your, your thoughts and see if you can reframe some of them in a positive way. So, uh, for example, if you are feeling um, sick and tired of working from home and, uh, you know, dealing with that, then think about the fact that so many people have uh, lost their jobs and 17 million people have filed for unemployment. So just having a job is uh, not an insignificant thing, you know, in the current time. Um, if you are feeling restless because you are, um, you know, uh, unable to leave the house because of lockdown, then think about how many people are homeless and how much harder it is to navigate uh, the current crisis for those people. Uh, and finally, a growing body of research also shows the health benefits of gratitude. So this goes along with the lines of a positive attitude and being thankful, but studies show that there is um, better sleep, less depression, enhanced well-being, and improved relationships from uh, gratitude practices. And one simple technique is to write a short email expressing your gratitude to someone in your life once a week. 
And the key thing with all gratitude practices is you have to be very specific with things that you appreciate. So um, this uh, example could be someone at work or someone uh, who is a family member or friend that you're, uh, maybe you haven't told them how grateful you are for their presence in your life and you just um, send that to them once a week. And, um, you know, I've been doing this for a while and people really respond to appreciation because it's uh, we don't get it as much as you know we probably need and uh, I think that it's uh, also a way to um, start a cycle of gratitude because usually they're very grateful for your email and it, it triggers that positive cycle um, I think other ways to practice gratitude are keeping a gratitude journal or thinking about reflecting on things you're grateful for at the end of the day and again the key thing with that is being very um, specific so um, you wouldn't want to just say you're grateful for work and health. You know, you'd, you'd want to think about a specific moment in the day when you were really touched. So for example, if it was a moment when your daughter told you how much she loved you and you felt really connected with her based on, you know, how she looked at you, then that would trigger those positive feelings of gratitude and thankfulness and well-being. So there is a variety of ways to incorporate these practices and I think the great thing about Ayurveda is that it's so holistic that it covers, you know, all of these dis different aspects of health. And um, I think the attitude and the mind-body connection is really crucial. So to learn more, um, you know, you can look at my book, The Paleovedic Diet, which has a, a book version and a Kindle version. Or uh, I've also created this online course, which is called Ayurveda and the Paleo Diet, which is an online video course, which covers all of these topics in more detail. So in conclusion, I just want to say that I think the real strength of Ayurveda is in prevention. And the, um, because it's so all-encompassing, it incorporates all of the material inputs to health, the food, the vitamins, the spices, the herbs, the digestion, you know, all of those things and also the more subtle factors. So these are maybe underappreciated, but no less important and equally powerful. And that includes the things like the sunlight, you know, nature exposure, the dinacharya, the daily routine, that is uh, really crucial. Things like the oil pulling, the neti pot, nasya, basic things like scraping your tongue every morning. You know, so much of these um, daily routine factors are really the pillars of good health. And so I think Ayurveda really offers us a comprehensive way to stay healthy during the current crisis. So thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to take some questions now. Thank you, Dr. Palani Sami. Uh, so much of what you were talking about evoked childhood memories of, of my grandmother running after us with a spoonful of chum and brush. Yeah, right, <laughs> we weren't right. the biggest fans of it or even taking five, 10 minutes and sitting in the sun as it came through the window. So, so much of Ayurveda has be become part of our, our culture and sometimes we don't name it. But, but we recognize it when we, when we hear about it. Um, I have a lot of questions for you. What I've tried okay. to do is try to um, kind of group them together. Uh, so the first question, and maybe we can do some rapid fire answers and people can mm -hmm. obviously go to your uh, website to learn more. But the first is uh, mushrooms are often said to be tamasic. And right. many Indian households try to stay away from them. Mm -hmm. How do mushrooms and their an anti-inflammatory effect in perhaps allopathic fit in with Ayurveda? And second follow-up on mushrooms, are they better cooked or raw? Okay, yeah, that's a very good question. I think that um, mushrooms should always be cooked, so uh, never eaten raw. The, that's the, the best way to prepare them, always cook them. And uh, it is true, yeah, I think that... Uh, you know, in Ayurveda, there is uh, that aspect in terms of uh, tamasic influence. Um, but I think that it's unmistakable that mushrooms do have these benefits in terms of the immune system. So I think that we have to look at the diet as a whole. You know, if you are eating um, a lot of like uh, oily fried foods, you know, other which are very tamasic, and then you're adding mushrooms on top of that, then that's not a good idea. But if you're having an overall very healthy sattvic diet, then the tamasic effect of mushrooms is not going to be um, significant, whereas the immune boosting effects are going to make a huge difference for the rest of your physiology. 
Okay, great. Um, next question is, um, what about vegetarian or vegan options for bone broth? Um, is bone broth thamasic? How about cod liver oil? Um, are there vegan or vegetarian options for that? Would cod liver oil also fall into thamasic? Yep. Um, no, I don't, those are actually some of the um, strongest OGIS building foods. So I do not consider them thamasic. Uh, and in terms of vegetarian alternatives, so for um, cod liver oil, you could do flax seed oil. I think that's a, a very good source of um, other beneficial you know, omega-3s. I think instead of bone broth, people can um, actually have okra. So okra is actually, because of its mucilaginous properties, it's a very profound gut healing food. Um, I think that is a really good way for vegetarians and vegans to incorporate that. And um, to get those omega-3s, um, having flaxseed oil, um, chia seeds, uh, walnuts, you know, those are, those are good as well. Okay, great. Um, in terms of seeds, here's a question on pumpkin seeds. Is there a daily uh, amount that you would recommend? So I'm uh, with uh, food, you know, there's not a, a specific daily amount. I think that um, aiming for maybe two tablespoons a day is probably a good. So it doesn't need to be a large quantity because they're so high in zinc. So two tablespoons a day would probably cover it. Okay. Um, from this listener, they heard that the virus has a certain pH level and in order to fight it, the foods that you eat need to have a pH level that is higher. Any thoughts to this? Yes, um, I've heard that as well. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there is no research that substantiates that. So I don't think it's, we can, it's really accurate uh, at this okay. time. Yeah. Sure. Um, do coconut-based yogurts have the same benefits as daily, uh, dairy-based yogurts? So they actually do. The study at Stanford, which looked at fermented foods, um, measured the amounts of live bacteria in non-dairy yogurts like coconut yogurt and almond yogurt, and actually found that they are pretty similar. And so I think it's reassuring that you know, they, they do have the same benefit. Okay. There were a couple of questions on garlic. I learned something new too about the 10 minutes. So are the health benefits of crushed garlic compromised if we freeze the crushed garlic and use it as needed? And then what about past the 10 minutes? So um, yeah, so freezing does uh, inactivate those um, uh, compounds, unfortunately. And uh, um, so it's better to use fresh garlic. And then past the 10 minutes, there's no problem. Yeah, you can keep it there for an hour. Uh, if you need to you know, refrigerate it and use it the next day, that's fine as well. Um, but freezing does inactivate those nutrients. And you may have mentioned this, but is it better to cook or eat it raw in terms of that nutritional value? So if you leave that 10 minutes uh, for it to um, process, you actually, it doesn't matter. You can okay. cook it or eat it raw. It, it has the same value at that point. Okay. Um, here's a question about apple cider vinegar. Um, would you recommend apple cider vinegar for people who have gastric acidity? So surprisingly, it actually is beneficial, even though uh, apple cider vinegar is acidic. And uh, um, I think the key thing is starting in a very low dose and diluting it a lot and taking it regularly. But um, it's, contra it's counterintuitive, but things like apple cider vinegar actually can help some people with uh, acidity. Okay. Um, so someone is asking whether juicing the combination of the various things that you mentioned, kale, ginger, lemon, oranges, apples, is that a good way to get nutrients or is it better to eat them whole? Well, Ayurveda is always um, more in favor of eating the food rather than juicing it because you're getting um, you know, a lot more of the nutrients that way. And then um, it is, of course, if you're pinched, uh, pressed for time, you can, you can juice them. But um, Ayurveda really recommends more eating the foods rather than juicing. Okay. Um, there was a question about turmeric. Is it uh, better in its raw form or in its powder form? And if you are taking pills, is there an expiration date or a point at which the benefits um, begin to diminish? Yeah. So with turmeric, I definitely recommend um, having it in the powdered form mostly, you know, like, like we all do with cooking. I think when you're taking it in pill form, like a supplement, it's much more powerful and that should really only be done under the uh, supervision of a practitioner, a licensed practitioner, because that should be for a specific uh, indication, specific time course, and 
um, I think with, with the, the powder, there's no limit to how much you can eat. And um, I recommend most people take it that way. Okay. Uh, so there have been some questions about uh, where are good places to buy some of these things, whether it's Javan brush or Amla powder or um, Ashwagandha. Is, does, does quality, I'm sure quality matters, but um, is there a recommended place that um, you have in mind? Yeah, I think um, I usually recommend buying organic. So there are a number of websites uh, online that sell organic versions of, of these. And even our local in, uh, grocery store here has some organic uh, versions of them. So that, that's what I would recommend. Okay. You're doing so great. We're getting through a lot of questions. <laughs> okay, Just a good. few more. Um, sure, sure. Could you comment on the use of saturated fats versus unsaturated? What oils would you recommend for cooking? Coconut oil, peanut oil, groundnut oil, olive oil? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that most people would probably do well with the combination of olive oil and coconut oil and, of course, ghee. Um, so I think that you have to be careful, of course, if you have um, high cholesterol or heart disease, then you worry more about the saturated fat, like with coconut oil and ghee. But for an average healthy person, um, I think getting a variety of um, coconut oil, ghee, and olive oil is good. And even with olive oil, you can cook with it. Um, I'm not a huge fan of peanut oil because uh, I don't think it has a lot of beneficial fatty acids, but those other three I mentioned are, are very good. Okay. Um, hopefully I will not mispronounce this. This can be our uh, last question. What about Nilavembu Kashayam or Kapasura water in preventing COVID-19 infection? Yeah, th that's referring to some of uh, these um, er unique herbal formulas which are in Ayurveda. So uh, again, we don't have any research to substantiate that. I know that there are some Ayurvedic doctors online who are claiming that they've done research and that you know XYZ uh, works against COVID-19. I, I think that's kind of irresponsible because we don't have human data that shows that this works. So I think uh, we should really focus on prevention, You know, focus on the diet, focus on spices and herbs and all those lifestyle practices. I don't think we should start using uh, you know, individual formulas to try to treat the virus or, or prevent it because we really don't have the data to support that. Sure. Well, there have been a ton of thank yous to you um, in the Q&A, and I would like to echo that sentiment that we've really learned a lot uh, tonight and really want to thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, to all the listeners out there, if you've enjoyed tonight's webinar, please be sure to share the podcast as it comes out tomorrow. It will also have the slide deck attached, um, at least in the messaging of it, with any friends and families who may have missed tonight's program. Also, don't forget to register for our next webinars in the Coping with COVID series. This Thursday, as kind of a corollary to tonight, we have an Ayurvedic cooking demonstration um, with Divya Alter of Divya's Kitchen in New York City. Uh, then next Tuesday on April 21st, we have uh, COVID-19 and the rise of cyberbullying and examining interactions during isolation. And um, on Monday, April 27th, we have a dialogue with uh, Deepak Chopra. And then sandwiched between all of that, we have a treat on Sunday, April 19th at 11.30. We have, uh, not in the series, but an ultimate dance fitness program called Bombay Jam, which one of our longtime supporters, uh, Thanvi Javeri Megani, has graciously offered. So if you feel cooped up and have some extra energy to burn, it's a fun way to do that. You can visit uh, hinduamerican.org front slash events to register. Again, thank you so much for joining us. For those of you out there, if you enjoy our programming, every little bit helps us to make sure that we can continue providing high quality programming and you can support us at hinduamerican.org. Have a good night. Namaste, everyone. Stay healthy and stay safe. Good night. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Okay.